Hollywood tends to work in phases. We're in the middle of a huge superhero movie phase, which now maybe seems to be on the downside. But 25 years ago, it was war movies that were all the rage in the wake of Saving Private Ryan. And once those started to taper off, historical epics became the blockbuster of choice for studios. Indeed, the smash success of Braveheart and Gladiator paved the way for this run of films, which started to taper off in the mid-aughts, although you still get the occasional offering, such as the upcoming Napoleon. I found the crown of France in the gutter and placed it atop my own head. A couple of mammothly pricey films, such as The Last Samurai and Troy, only earned modest profits for their studios, so the genre just couldn't sustain itself. One such film, which didn't make a ton of money, was 20th Century Fox's Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. It earned critical raves, but cost too much to become the franchise Fox was hoping for, with it being based on a long-running series of books by author Patrick O'Brien. Yet, the movie holds up mighty well all these years later, prompting a revisit. Now to pull this predator in close, let's bring our trap. Jack. Yes. You're the predator. Jump back to the year 2003. Russell Crowe was one of the biggest stars in the world. Gladiator was one of those rare films that made tons of money, but also earned critical raves and Oscars. Are you not entertained? Crowe himself won the Best Actor trophy and came pretty close to winning the award again the following year for A Beautiful Mind, which, surprisingly, made a ton of money. I need to believe that something extraordinary is possible. Everyone wanted Crow to be in their big historical epic, so having him sign on to make Master and Commander was a coup. It helped that the film was to be directed by Peter Weir, one of the most underrated directors of all time. He's made more than his share of masterpieces. These include The Last Wave, Gallipoli, The Year of Living Dangerously, Witness, Dead Poets Society, and The Truman Show. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> The film was to be a pet project of 20th Century Fox studio head Tom Rothman, who was a fan of the books by O'Brien. These novels follow the adventures of Captain Jack Aubrey, a ship's captain during the Napoleonic Wars. His best friend is the ship's surgeon, Stephen Maturin. Stephen, I invite you to this cabin as my friend. Not to criticize nor to comment on my command. Well, should I leave you until you're in a more harmonious frame of mind? The books run 21 volumes, and the film itself would draw on the series as a whole rather than one particular novel, although the principal source is the tenth novel, The Far Side of the World. The film would be about Captain Aubrey's obsession with tracking down the French privateer, the Archeron, which took their ship, the HMS Surprise, by, well, surprise, causing heavy damage. What is it with this man? I kill a relative of his in battle, perhaps? His boy, God forbid. He fights like you, Jack. While not a match for the French ship, Aubrey will not shirk from his duty to protect the British fleet, so the chase is on. There's not a moment to lose. While certainly making for a rousing tale, there are a few reasons why Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World was seen as a risk. For one thing, Crow would be asked to gain weight to play the portly Aubrey, although he didn't go all out, and the action would be mostly confined to naval battles. There wouldn't be a big mono a mono fight such as in Gladiator, although Russell Crowe does do a little bit of dueling in the finale. The film would also have to be shot partly on the water, something which spelled doom for the budgets of Waterworld and Titanic. Perhaps that's why Fox wound up bringing in two more big studios to co-finance the film, Universal Pictures and Miramax. However, the budget would be contained at a relatively reasonable $150 million, although this was pretty big for 2003 as Weta was able to provide cutting-edge visual effects which would cut down on the time needed to shoot on water. Notably, the film would also be the first non-documentary shot in the Galapagos Islands. How long does the captain intend that we stay? Do you know? While well, Russell Crowe's Jack Aubrey is the star in many ways, Stephen Maturin is just as important a role. If Aubrey is like Captain Kirk, Maturin is a combination of Spock and Dr. McCoy. In essence, it was a second star role, but luckily Paul Bettany had just supported Crow to great effect in A Beautiful Mind and proved to be ideal casting. Indeed, critics hailed Crow and Bettany's performances, saying they were perfectly cast, and both actors have noted that they would love to have made more films in the series. The supporting cast, which was almost exclusively male, 
would include Lord of the Rings star Billy Boyd, James Darcy, who would later join Bettany in the MCU, and a host of character actors. Indeed, Weir made a gorgeous film with excellent cinematography by Russell Boyd, which is at once an epic but also grounded by two things. One is the grim reality of life on board a ship, with a young boy serving on the crew losing an arm while later one loses his life. We therefore commit their bodies to the deep, to be turned into corruption, looking for the resurrection of the body when the sea shall give up her dead and the life of the world to come. You can also see a wobbly officer lose his mind under the strain of the voyage while Maturin is wounded so badly himself that he has to operate on his own self in a really queasy scene that I'm pretty sure was an influence on the climactic moment in the Nick that everybody was talking about. The film also benefits enormously from the camaraderie between Crow and Betney, with the relationship between Aubrey and Maturin making you invest not only in the adventure, but also in their friendship. It's a crime they never got to do a follow-up, although with TV having come so far, perhaps Master Commander could be done as a limited series. Crow and Betney are probably two big names though to have done a limited series, but who knows, one could dream. Whatever the case, it will likely will have to be done without Peter Weir, who seems mostly retired now. At any rate, the franchise was doomed when the film underperformed, only grossing about $210 million worldwide. Again, a pretty solid number, but the movie was very expensive. Lads, that's not good enough. We need to fire two broadsides to her one. You want to see a guillotine in Piccadilly? No! You want to call that raggedy ass Napoleon your king? No! You want your children to sing the Marseillaise? No! Mr. Mort, Mr. Pulling, stop a battery! The film was nominated for many technical Oscars and won for Russell Boyd's cinematography. Well deserved. To note, it's become a perennial favorite on streaming services, with many noting the strong friendship between the two leads as being an excellent depiction of male camaraderie. Certainly, Master and Commander of the Frost of the World is a gem. And if it's a one-off, it's a brilliant one that holds up extremely well 20 years later. In fact, I'd wager it hasn't been dated at all. England is under threat of invasion. And though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. This ship is England. 